Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Champions Way webinar. This is Sensei Nick. On behalf of Champions Way, we'd like to introduce Professor Robert Drysdale. Professor Drysdale is a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as well as being a martial arts school owner. And also, he's tr uh, currently training several UFC fighters, including Frank Mir, Forrest Griffin, and Randy Gator, to name a few. In today's webinar, Professor Drysdale will be reviewing exactly how to start, implement a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu program in your studio. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Professor Robert Drysdale. They're very knowledgeable, but they have zero charisma. Everyone is a teacher. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Being friendly, being social, communicating, hearing your students' problems, making sure they come back the next day, calling them by the name, noticing when they don't show up, things like that. So you want to have someone you trust to help with the beginners. And uh, it's a huge, it makes a big difference. Okay, so like every now and then you're still you still get involved. Like I, I'll, I'll jump in my beginner class goes at the same time as my other class, and I'm always jumping in the beginner's class to check on them, see how they're doing, and then I'll go back to my main class. But uh, it's 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 important that you know you have someone you trust there running that beginner program. Okay, last one. It's really important to separate beginners from the main class. They need special attention and to be taught the fundamentals first before branching out to more advanced techniques. This goes without saying. You know, not everyone, like, you know, majority of your beginners don't have any previous experience. Well, the only experience they have of, uh, of jiu-jitsu is from the UFC. So they've seen an arm bar, and they've seen in the rear naked choke, and they're ready to train. Well, they're not. There's a lot that they have to learn. They, 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 they have to go through the fundamentals. And this is a big problem because a lot of guys, when they walk in, because people think, oh, intermediate and advanced, oh, that's better. Why let the beginner? Beginner's not as good as advanced when they forget that they have to crawl before they can walk, they have to walk before they can run. So if most people are cool with this, but you're going to get a lot of people walking through your door there. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. I already know what I'm talking about. Like, no, you've got to get beginner's class. Get the fundamentals. If you're very consistent about it and you pick it up quickly, you might move to the intermediate class a little bit faster. But typically speaking, it takes around six months of training before I move them to the uh, uh, intermediate and advanced class. Uh, show the beginners the utmost basics such as concepts of tapping when someone hurts, when something hurts, and the safety rules around the gym. Educate the new students of the safe training dynamic of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and that you must take care of yourself and your training partners. Now, this a lot of this is common sense, but you know, you, you never know. When you're talking about a beginner, you don't know what you're going to get. So it might be someone that has never uh, uh, done any martial arts before, doesn't know how to tap. If that's, I've made that mistake before. I did not tell a beginner to tap when it hurt. And this guy's getting an armboard. He has no idea what's going on. So something as basic as that, like, yeah, you have to teach. Hey, you know what? And teach them. Don't, don't tap the mats. Don't tap yourself. Tap your partner. Tap, tap your training partner. Because if he doesn't see it or doesn't hear it, at least he will feel it. So something like that, as, as fundamental as it is, a lot of people are completely unaware of it if they've never done any previous training, which is the majority of your clientele. So, uh, um, you know, and of course, like, thinking, well, you know, it, it, Common sense things like taking care of yourself and your training partners, making sure no one's getting hurt. Most people are cool, but you're always going to get that wild man, that one guy that wants to prove to the whole world that he's the toughest guy in there. And the, those guys with that attitude, two things. They're either going to change, okay, because they're, they're going to realize that that attitude does not fit in with the gym, or two, they're going to leave. And when guys like that leave my gym, I'm actually not that upset. They're going to walk in and cause problems and think you're the man and you're just going to try to hurt people and throw people on concrete, then, you know, I'd rather have you leave. That rarely happens, but occasionally, you know, it, it will happen. Uh, how do students watch uh, the other role and become familiar with what jiu-jitsu is? However, if they have experience in the past, depending on experience, let them join the rest of the group if they have had no experience but are still eager to roll. Have them roll with each, uh, with either yourself or one of your most experienced students and only for five, ten minutes at a light pace. Okay. So once again, it depends on who's walking through that door. This has happened to me before. You get a guy that's been wrestling for five years, and you're going to begin. He still has to go to the beginner squats because there's still fundamentals he has to learn. But that guy's going to pick it up a lot faster than the guy that's never done any martial arts. So that guy is probably going to be moved to intermediate class a little bit faster. Uh, same thing with a judoka. The one that trained judo is like a judo black belt. And generally speaking, like could be probably moved into the intermediate class right away because they depend on what judo school he came from. He should have that. That, uh, uh, that ground experience already. Uh, if a lot, like some guys, like you know, after after like a few, uh, uh, at the first class, like they want to roll, like I'll roll before with my cousin in his garage, and we train there for a month, you know. And if he's really insistent, I, I hate telling people no, 
So I'll, I'll go with them myself. We'll have one of my more experienced instructors go with them and easy. Just kind of light pace. Just the guy so that, so that I can break a sweat. Once again, there are some people are more eager than others uh, uh, to step on the mat. Like, you know, I remember my first class when I saw people rolling. Like, I mean, I was like a dog on a leash. I was like, let me train, let me train, let me train. I was like, I just wanted to do that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it was something I was looking forward to do. So I understand that anxiety. So uh, it's something you definitely want to uh, offer your students if they're really eager to do so. But still, it has to be one with one of your more experienced instructors or with yourself. And at a light pace, a short round, you don't have to have them on the mat for 30 minutes straight. Five, 10 minute round, that's more than enough. Okay. Beginners always begin a round of grappling on their knees. They won't begin standing until they are comfortable enough with being taken down. Remember that injury rates during takedowns are a lot higher. Before beginners start a round on their feet, make sure that they have learned the basic break falls first and are comfortable with these techniques. So the, the, the break falls are all part of the curriculum. They're all the class format. We do it at, you know, I'd say almost every day. There are days where I switch to warm up a little bit, but normally they're doing them every day. And it teaches you how to fall. Now this is a big problem because A, standing takes a lot more mat space than knees. And, and B, the injury ratio is a little bit high when people are uh, 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 going for takedowns. So it's something I'm very aware of. You have to be careful about it. Make sure, like if you have a small class, that's a perfect day to have them start standing. If it's a busy class, have them start on their knees. Always make sure no knee wrestling, you know, because knee wrestling ends up being like half the match. You could just stay on their knees pushing each other, kind of like sumo wrestling, and nothing happens. Well, if I see that happening, I stop them, and I tell one of them to go to guard. And then, and then you know, the next time, the next round, you guys switch roles. So you're, you're top now, you're bottom the next one. That way we get a match going, otherwise they end up under these the whole time and nothing happens. It is recommended that all students remain in the beginner's class until they achieve their second stripe, which equates to about six months of training. A stripe is awarded every three months, depending on their consistency. So there we go. So six months training is about the time someone's going to spend on the beginner's class for them to learn the fundamentals. So, you know, if they're consistent about it, they should be able to go through the whole curriculum more than once at least twice. I mean, that's, that's the man. So you go every single move in the, in the white to blue curriculum uh, uh, twice. That would be the, the, the end goal. Of course, no one's like, you know, no one's going to be 100% uh, uh, consistent about classes. People skip a day or two, or they travel, or they get injured, or they get sick, whatever the reasons may be. Six months is about average. If the guy's in the gym every day, let's say you offer a class every day, and the guy in there every day, after four or five months, you can move him to the intermediate class if you, you know, if you feel that like he's ready to move on to that level. If not, you want to keep him there a little bit longer. If you have to keep him there for eight months, so be it. No big deal. It all depends on his consistency and if he's ready or not to move up. So a stripe that goes every three months uh, on average for a white belt. So like all the way to his blue belt, every three months, if he's consistent about it, he's going to be getting a stripe. So a little over after a year, he should be getting his blue belt if he's consistent about training. And when I say consistent, once again, I don't mean every day, but you know, I, I, I would say an average of three times a week at least. You know, like anything less than that, you know, it's, it, everyone's got their own schedule. But you should be, hey man, you're not. Don't expect to get, you know, to to, to move up quickly if you're only going to show up once a week. Okay, it's, it's really not that complicated. Important tips: hygiene. Make sure that all your students' keys are clean and they are clean to train, and that nails are trimmed. Respect the other students. This has been a problem more than once. You always get that one guy who just won't wash his gear, trim with his gear three times before he washes it. With the guy that doesn't trim his nails, uh, I have problems with people with really bad breath. Uh, people that just came from work and they stunk. So, like, what do you do? Well, it's, it's. I mean, I put, I put, I put a, a, a sign on the wall, and most people get a clue. But every now and then, you're gonna have to walk up to one of your students and go, "Hey, man, can you use any way you can shower before you you you, you step on a mat? Because that could be a problem." Like that's happened to me before where I had to tell the guy, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And a month later, I had to tell him again because he wasn't showering. He just wasn't using the deodorant. And all the students were complaining. No one wanted to train with him. So it's, it's, a, it's, an, un, it's an awkward, uncomfortable situation. But, you know, you're, as an instructor, you have to step up and make sure that their keys are clean, they're trimming their nails, and basic hygiene. You know, it's common sense, but some people every now and then need a, need a little reminder. Etiquette. So students are to line up in order of rank at the start and end of class. So this is depending on what the, 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 the shape of your mats. They can be right next to each other or behind one another, depending on what you normally typically do at your school. That can vary. Uh, but it goes in order of rank. It goes in order of rank. 
and you know we line up, we bow to the end, at the end of the class, and at the end we all go in line and we shake each other's hands uh, one by one all the way to the end of the line. It just it just uh, uh, it just marks the beginning and the end of the class. It's pretty fundamental. Most martial arts do it already. Uh, you know, if if you if you have a specific way of doing it at your school, it's you know it's it's fine. It's no big deal. I normally have them lining uh, 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 lined up uh, uh, side by side, just like they are in the picture. That's what I normally do. If the class is really busy, I'll have a second row right in front of them. Students should sit down with legs crossed, kneeling or standing up while listening to instruction as a gesture of respect to the teacher. So every now and then you're going to get that guy that as you're teaching, he's laying on a mat like he's on the beach or something. Or he's, you know, it's like, it's just disrespectful. It just looks bad. So like, it's not that big of a deal. Look, you stand up, you sit cross-legged, you're on your knees, or just you, know, you can be in a comfortable position. Just don't lay down. You know, just don't, you're not, you're not at the beach. Show some respect. So most people are okay with uh, about that, but every now and then you have to remind uh, uh, remind students of this. Another thing too is very important. A lot of times when the guys will be taking a break during rounds, have them sit on the wall. Make sure they have their legs crossed. I've seen this happen more than once where they have their legs straight out on the mats, and the other guy gets swept on top of your foot and then you're your foot and you hurt your uh, hurt your ankle because your legs were extended. Cross your legs, stay as close as possible to the wall, and if possible, even off the mat if you're not training. You know, so it's just it, it, it's just basic, basic uh, uh, safety rules. Students are to bow when entering and leaving the mats. Like a lot of, uh, uh, like for example, I, I deal with a lot of wrestlers, the MMA fighters especially, and they're not used to that. They come from a kickboxing or a boxing background or a wrestling background where they don't do this. In jiu-jitsu, is something we've always done. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you, hey, you can't get on, you know, give me 100 push-ups if you don't bow. I just, I just normally walk up to the guy like, hey, man, you know, we bow before we enter the mat. I know you're not used to it, but just not bow before you enter and leave the mat. It's no big deal. People are cool with it. You know, I've never had anyone, you know, disrespect that rule. It's pretty, pretty basic. Students must ask for permission to leave and enter mat. This is a sign of respect and important, seeing as the instructors should know where the students are at all times, especially during kids' classes. So you don't enter and don't leave the mat without uh, uh, the student, uh, the, the the teacher's authorization. It's pretty basic. Uh, you know, just just let them know. Like I'm going to the toilet, or uh, I need uh, I need a break. I'm going to grab some water, or I, you know I'm late for something. I have to leave the mat. I have to go pick up my kid. Whatever the reason may be, just make sure that the students are letting the instructor aware of it. You are the leader. Behave like one. Set an example on the mats. This goes without saying. You know, if you don't do it, your students won't do it either. You know, if you if you go in the bathroom without your flip flops on, you can't expect your students not to do the same thing. So if you if you want to make sure the mats are clean, you know, you do the, do your best to keep the mat the mats clean yourself. This this is uh once again it's common sense goes without saying. Always stick to one theme per week: mount, escape, back attack, sweep, some close guard. So the students are able to remember the series of techniques better and can apply what is taught with more ease. The reason I say this is. You know, when I first started training, a lot of the a lot of our practice was kind of random. It's like it was arm bar, and then it was mount escape, and then it was back attack on the same day. You know, it's, I think students they they have a hard time learning if the moves aren't connected. So they should always be in a chain. So, for example, if I'm showing a mount escape, I'm showing one move that that, and if he blocks, I'll go plan B, and if he blocks plan B, I'll go to plan C. And the next day, I'll do something similar, but with a different twist. I'll show a different mountain escape. But we were doing mountain escape for the whole week, so that by the end of the week, you know, the student, you know, got to go again. You got to remember that not every student is going to be there every day. He should have at least three or four different options. And this is how we learn. You're never going to pick up every single move, but there's always going to be that one move that oh, I really like that. That I can do. That one move that for some reason it's easier for us to download. You know, you see that move like, oh wow, I love that. Boom, I get it. So I'm 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 in favor of giving my students as many options as possible, and letting them choose which move they like the best, which move they want to use uh, in order to be successful. Uh, so like this goes on for weeks. Sometimes it goes on for two weeks. I've had that happen. You know, I I show like mountains give a whole week, and then by the end of the week they're still not really getting it. I'll give them another week, and that's all we're going to do. We start half the round. So let's say you do four or five minute rounds every day. At least two of those rounds will begin from mount uh, uh, from, uh, from the mount position. That way, you know you're forcing your student to work on that situation. So when he is confronted with that situation, it's not new to him. Oh, I've done a whole week on how to escape mount, so it's not something new to him. 
is okay to repeat position if students didn't get it. Please be in tune with the students and listen to their feedback. Also encourage the students to speak up if they don't understand something. Uh, you know, this is this is very basic. Uh, just if, if, if you feel like your student wants, you have to be able to read your class. If your students are having a hard time understanding something, take your time, explain it again. Uh, you might you might have to show them one move that day. It might be a very complicated move. They're not getting it. It's very new to them. Have them drill it. You know, have them drill it. You're going to do it again. You're going to do it again. You're going to do this for the next 30 minutes. That's all you're going to do until you get this move. And uh, they don't complain. I've never had any students get upset about that. It's not a big deal. Just it's like basic fundamental discipline. And uh, most people that are in martial arts, they have that discipline anyway. Okay, so uh, just have them do it again. Okay. Also, you know, if, if someone's having a problem, make sure you give them the opportunity to ask questions. It's something I always do after I show a movie. You guys got any questions? And there's, you know, there normally is a question. What about this or what about that? Or after they're done practicing drilling the move, I'll ask them again. Any questions? Any problems? And sometimes someone raise their hand and go like, "What if a guy does this? Or I'm having a problem with that. Why is that happening?" And then you give an answer, and then uh, you're ready to move on. Be attentive to your students. Walk around and correct them. Avoid sitting, talking to people off the mat, using your phone. Give them all the attention they deserve. Pretty basic. Uh, it, it is a problem. Some instructors get distracted. You know, maybe they've taught a lot that day. They had a long day. Uh, it, you know, I've done this before. Everyone's made this mistake before. You're tired. Or just your energy is just not there. But your students notice. Your students do notice these things. So really make an effort into being as attentive and as active during your class as possible. They deserve that attention. You know, they worked hard too. They come to the gym a lot of times, they're tired from work. So when they get there, they want to have a good class and you, it's, it's your job to teach them a good class. Be flexible and listen to your class. Understand that most people don't want to train like professional athletes. Breaks during sessions are optional for everyone. So my, my class is like, especially the, uh, 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 I have the competition class, which some deal is the pace is a little bit different, and that thing, and, 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 and that's something completely separate. But as far as like the uh, beginners, you know, I, I give them like I give them breaks whenever they want. And, like if halfway through the round they go like, "Hey, Rob, I'm too tired. Can I drink some water?" Absolutely, go. It's your pace. You go as hard as you want to go. No one's going to push you. If you want to be pushed, then you come and talk to me. Hey, Rob, don't let me. I mean, you want to? I want you to push me to the next level. I'll give you a little extra push, but. Generally speaking, it's, it's pretty chill. You, you go to the toilet whenever you need to. You drink water whenever you need to. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna be super strict on a guy that's been working, you know, eight nine hours straight and still have to go home to his family. So it's it's it's, it's supposed to be fun. That's the main thing. It's you're just supposed to be fun, and it should be a, a, a healthy and fun environment. Feel free to make a Q and A session between rounds or after class, and encourage students to speak up and to be proactive about their learning. This is something I love to do. The students love it as well. We'll have a Q&A session after class, sometimes during class. If they're really tired and we still got another 20 minutes to go, I'll just give you all give these guys a five minute break. And I'll just sit, I'll, I'll just sit them on the map. So I want to stand like Q&A, where are you guys getting stuck? Where are you having problems? And they'll bombard me with questions. And then I'm just, you know, then I'm just answering the questions, solving their problems. And every now and then there's going to be a question I don't, I don't have a good answer to, like, like a rules question, like, oh, I'm not a hundred percent sure of that, but I'll look it up on, and you know, and then I'll get back to you tomorrow with that or tonight. And uh, it's a very democratic session. Everyone speaks out. Sometimes, like you know, we one student caught the other with a sweep, and they don't know what they did, so they'll do it again to me, and then we'll try to break it down and explain. Okay, this is what happened. So it's a very technical uh, 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 part of the class, and you can do this whenever. It can be once again during the class or after class. Students love it. Uh, it gives them a break, it gives them time to relax and really think about jiu-jitsu instead of just uh, uh, practicing jiu-jitsu. Uh, give them two, one two-minute break or longer if necessary between rounds. This gives your, uh, your guys time to rest and gives you time to match them up for the next round. So a two-minute break is pretty good. Now once again, if it's more intermediate, advanced level or a competition class, you can make the breaks a little bit shorter. But two minutes is about a good time. It gives them time to go to the toilet, drink some water. And while they're drinking water, you're just like sh uh, changing partners. So that's two minutes is about the, the, the uh, as, uh, as much time as they need. Once again, it depends on how long the rounds are. If you're making 10 minute rounds, you know, two minutes is, you know, you might want to make it three minutes. But most, you know, it's for beginners, I don't recommend that. Stick to five minute rounds, two minute breaks. And uh, that, that, that seems to work really well. Okay. Make appropriate space for your students to grapple. Standing takes more room while beginning on your knees. 
takes less space. Therefore, more students can safely participate in a round of property at one time. So we've been over this before. Uh, Beginners especially, start on their knees. If they are knee resting, just tell them one, one of the two has to go to guard. Or you can always have them start in specific situations like closed guard or half guard or whatever it is that you're working on. But um, you know, especially beginners, have them start on their knees. Beginners don't know how to fall. They don't know how to apply takedowns. They're uh, generally speaking less. Uh, uh, they're they're, they're kind of clueless about what hurts and what doesn't. And uh, so you know, you just kind of want to take it easy and don't 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 have them start standing uh, for a little while. Respect age, gender, athletic ability, weight, skill level, match your students up accordingly. So once again, you know, they got, you get that wild man, the guy that's been training for, you know, that guy's been wrestling his whole life and he wants to fight in MMA, very athletic guy. You're not going to put him with a 50-year-old man or with a, you know, with a 12-year-old little girl. So, you know, just basic common sense. And if you have to put that one athletic guy with the other big athletic guy, have him go every single round. If you feel like one of those big guys is going to hurt a member of your class, just have him go with each other. And always tell them to slow down too. You know, so match them up. You know, just 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 reasonably. <laughs> Excuse me. Be the best that you can be. Constantly seek to improve yourself as an instructor, both as a role model and guide, and as a technician. If you're not getting better, you are getting worse. That's my model. I'm always telling that to my students. I'm always telling myself that. And this, I think, goes for everything in life. You know, sometimes we get like, complacent and go, like, "Oh, I'm good enough." I you know, it's never good enough. We're always improving. Whatever it is, business, teaching, uh, uh, training, everything. It's an ever, it's a uh, never-ending process. So it's something I'm always telling my students too. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. So be consistent about it. Stri uh, uh, strive to improve. You're never, don't ever feel like, you know, don't ever let your students feel like they know enough. There's always going to be that one guy in the gym that, that beats everyone. He's thinking like, oh, I'm good enough. I'm like, no, it's not good enough, man. You're good at this right here. But there are all these other moves right here that you're not good at. Why don't you work on this stuff? Try to master these other moves now. So thing, you know, it's 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 pretty basic, but uh, I think it's very important to always keep reinforcing that so students don't get complacent. And they go like, oh, okay, I'm I'm good enough. I'm beating everyone at the gym, so I'm good enough. No, it's never good enough. And I say this from someone I've been to just to just my whole adult life, and I don't feel like I'm anywhere near uh, a point of mastering the sport of jujitsu. There's so much. It's such. It's a giant. Uh, it, it, there's so much information out there. There's so many different moves, so many different techniques, so many different skills to master. You should always be striving to, uh, to make yourself better. And once again, not just for jujitsu. As an, as an instructor, as a business person, uh, it's it's never good enough. Your students can tell when you put your heart and soul into teaching. Every student can tell. You know, if you're if you're getting if you're slacking, if you're not really there mentally, if you're thinking about you know. You know the argument you had with your wife the day before, or whatever. Your students can tell. So really try to, you know, once you once you step on the mat, that's sacred ground. That's 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 what it's all about. Jiu Jitsu. It's all about training. It's all about improving. You want to step away from all your problems outside, and you just want to stick with, uh, uh, you know, you just want to stick with Jiu Jitsu. Give your students the best class you can give them. And I know it's not always easy, you know, but it's 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 pretty it, it's important. And students notice. Students notice. They, you know, they I, I know this because. I can tell one when one of my instructors teaching class and the other one teaching class, one has a very high uh, retention ratio and the other one's a lot lower. And when I watch the two teach classes, the one that has a high retention is like he's ten times more animated about class. He's very enthusiastic about it, very charismatic. Whereas the other guy is kind of just like, yeah, I just can't wait for this class to be over. So, you know, it's it, it tells by you know, the number the amount of students that are showing up to class how good of an instructor uh, uh, the instructor is. Uh, let me see. Okay, be the best you can. You can be. Learn each and every student name by heart. Take notice note of their training consistency, their injuries, their participation in other events such as tournaments. If the students feel like they are part of something, then their training experience will be much more enjoyable, and they will remain a valued, valued and integral member, integral member of your school. Uh, this is like one thing I'm very adamant about is. You know, like you know, just just knowing your student by name, it's basic. You know, I I'm, I think I said this before, but I'm against a lot of big gyms in Vegas, and I my, I know I have a higher retention rate than any other school because because of that. Like when when, when my students get injured, I know of their injuries. Can I go and talk to them about it when they come back? Well, sometimes I even give them a call. Hey, man, how you doing? Is your knee feeling better? So it, it's just you be friends with your students, even if you have a whole bunch. You should be friends with them. You know, and just uh, uh, create, develop a relationship with all of them. And then 
you know, you know that that guy is never going to leave because he knows he's going to be missed. So with a big gym, if, it, if you're going to run a gym just like a gold gym, then, you know, if they, if they ever stop training, they have no incentive to go back to the same place because they don't know anyone there. They don't feel like they're missed. So they, they develop that family environment when, uh, at your gym, and the guys will always come back. They'll always come back. They'll be loyal to you for life because they know that, that guy's my friend. You know, that guy cares when I'm injured. He cares when I'm not training. Give him, I ask him, like, how come you've been training? I haven't seen you in a whole week. You know, and then they're like, you know, like, oh, I was, I was, I was traveling or I had a lot of work or I was sick. But they're happy that you, that you noticed that they didn't show up. Word of mouth is the best, cheapest, and most effective way to generate new students. If you stick to the guidelines and make the students feel important and provide the best service possible, that will guarantee a successful refer, uh, referral program. So once again, all marketing is valid. Everything, you know, there's so many different ways you can market your school. But I think we can all agree that word of mouth is the best one. I, I, I make it a little incentive for my students. If you sign a friend up, I'll give you a free gift. You know, which is, you know, it's not going to cost uh, the team a fortune, but, you know, you get another student in there that's going to bring another student, another student, especially kids. Kids bring in kids like crazy. Uh, so that's, 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 but once again, if I, that, that's where I put most of my energy into. If I run a successful, uh, if I, for me to run a successful program, I have to, I have to develop a, a family environment at the gym. I have to teach a good class. There has to be consistency about the classes, good techniques. And when everything inside the gym is running smoothly, I just know that people will flock to my gym because my students will be so happy in there that they're going to want every single one of their family members, every single one of their friends, every single one of their classmates to come over and join because they're having so much fun. Okay? So that will be it. If, uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can all, uh, always email us or give us a call. Email us on the screen, seminars at drive.jujitsu.com. And... Uh, yeah, I think we've got a few minutes here for a Q&A session, so if you guys want to ask any questions, uh, go ahead. Well, thanks so much, Rob. Uh, that was awesome. And uh, real quick, we're, you know, we have some questions coming in, and what I'll do is I'll read them back to you, Professor, and then you can just go through them. Also, guys, uh, a couple of really interesting things coming out in the next week. Uh, Professor Drysdale is implementing, or I'm sorry, offering his new curriculum as well as affiliate program, so we're going to have more on that. And if you're interested in more on that, you could also send an email to seminars at drysdellejujitsu.com. Uh, it's all on the Perfect Mind platform. It's an amazing curriculum and also a licensing program for affiliate uh, schools all over the world. So uh, let's see what we have. A couple questions coming in. All right. So first question, Professor. Uh, actually, this looks like a question for us. Uh, sorry, I uh, got on this late. Is it recorded? And that's from RJ LeBear. RJ, how are you, sir? Uh, yes, this was recorded and it will be emailed out. Uh, to everybody afterwards. So yes, it was recorded and will be emailed as well. All right, next question, uh, and this is definitely for you, Professor. How many stripes per belt? Uh, four. That's a good question. I've seen schools give five, but that's very unusual. It goes four stripes. Uh, once again, why, for kids, every month or two, depending on how consistent they are, we give them a stripe. Uh, uh, recently, the belt grade for kids has changed IBJJF. So you used to go white, yellow, orange, and green. But that's not enough belts for kids, because especially some of these kids start showing they're five, and they won't be they won't be adults until they're they won't be getting their blue belt adult the, the adult belt, the blue belt at sixteen. So that's a long time for a kid only get promoted three times. So now the recent the, the, the belt system goes white to uh, I think it's white and gray, and then gray, and then gray and yellow and yellow, yellow and orange, orange, orange and green, and then green. And on top of all that, you have all the, uh, uh, you have four stripes per belt. So there's a lot more promotion going on for kids now, which, which was a huge problem uh, uh, in BJJ. So the, 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 the Jiu-Jitsu Federation, they changed that recently, just a few months ago. So the official kids grading has changed, and they're getting uh, graded more consistently. As far as adults, the belts haven't changed. And it goes with your white to blue belt every three months. You know, if they're you know reasonably consistent about their training. And uh, once they get their blue belts and purple belts and brown belts, it goes every six months. So they should be you know it, it, once again it depends on the consistency. Every you know if the guy's in there every day, every four months you can give him a strike, no big deal. And then, it, but at, when it comes to blue, purple, and brown, they should be at least a year and a half in each belt. I mean, I've seen people get promoted sooner, but that's when they're exceptional. It's rare. It doesn't happen very often. 
but if they're exceptionally talented, they're picking it up so quick, in those cases you can move them up a little bit faster. But generally speaking, I'd say after you get your blue belt, it's a year and a half to two years per grading. And then so the striping goes every five, six months, depending on consistency. Excellent. Uh, another question would be here, how much does it cost to get started to work with you as an affiliate? Okay, we're, st we're still working the prices. It's something we're still discussing. Uh, uh, you want me to take that one for you, Rob? Yeah, I know Nick, Nick's probably better ask, uh, answer that question. Go ahead, Nick. Absolutely. Uh, currently, guys, we, we're going to be offering two programs, uh, and the one will be a, pretty much a basic virtual curriculum. Uh, you will not get any type of uh, you know, criticism or feedback. Uh, it'll just be like videos that you'll have access to. Uh, that's a, a, a program that will be virtual. It's approximately $99 a month. Uh, affiliates are four ninety nine a month, and that includes everything. That's the package that you know that if you're really interested in becoming a Drysdale affiliate and working with Professor and having him uh, be able to rank your students, uh, getting certified through him, that's the all in one. Also, the marketing paraphernalia is included in that. Uh, you get the entire uh, library of, like I said, marketing. Uh, if you if you're a member of the Champions Way Library uh, and you see how we have all the marketing ads and also all the uh, training courses. Uh, it's very it's very similar, and then you also have the curriculum: white to blue, blue to uh, blue to purple, purple to brown, uh, and then you also get, would you actually get your black belt, and you also be able to use the Drysdale logo for your program. So that's approximately four ninety nine, and that's those are the two programs we're offering. So there'll be we're pretty much we're, we're going to be doing a webinar probably I'd say the beginning of June. Uh, all the everything is getting done and finalized the next week or so. We're really excited about it. So. Uh, if you need more information about that, you could always send me an email to sensei.nick at championsway.com. Uh, you know, professors uh, are very busy, obviously, you know, all over training people and running as affiliates. So we're we're going to be helping professor with that, and we'll be uh, doing a lot of that. So if you have any other questions, you could offer that. I, I'm sorry, you could uh, just send me an email again to sensei.nick at championsway.com, or you could uh, also email seminars at drysdalejujitsu.com. So we'll have more information about that shortly, and then we're really excited about that as well. Uh, is the virtual program separated by belts? Yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, yes, uh, we have. So we have uh, the the white to blue curriculum. Uh, we have a blue to purple curriculum, a purple to brown curriculum, and we have the kids curriculum: white to yellow, yellow to orange, orange to green. Uh, I know the belt the, the the belt system has changed, so it goes uh, white to gray, gray to yellow. Uh, but there's still, I mean, the, the curriculum is going to be the same for the white to yellow. It's going to be the same as it was. It was as, as the one from white to gray, and then gray to yellow. Uh, it's 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 basically the same as uh, I, it's, it's like a watered down version of the adult curriculum. It's, it's a, the, the adult curriculum, but it's a lot easier because it's for kids. So for adults, I'll be showing a total of let's say 90 moves. For kids, we're going to show 30 or 40, and that's in a you know that's in a one year period, so uh, it's 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 a lot easier. It's a lot uh, 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 it's 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 sort of like a, a a more mild version of the adult curriculum. And uh, and and yes, like there's like once again, like there are the, the online curriculum is divided by belts. So you're gonna have like for for example, when you type in white to blue belt on the search bar, you gonna have you know all the the, the moves that are required for that curriculum. If you know, if you're, if you're teaching more advanced guys and you're going to go through the white, the blue to purple curriculum, then you get the same thing, and all the blue to purple moves are going to come up. So they are divided. Once again, and as far as the belt requirements, it's not the curriculum. It's it's, it's less the curriculum. The curriculum I'm offering like the basic moves that everyone should learn, but I don't expect everyone to remember every single move because the curriculum is very extensive. So when it comes to grading, I'm asking for a lot less. So for example, from blue to purple, I might show six sweeps from closed guard, but when it comes to the belt test, I'm going to ask for three. So it's not going to be, I don't expect uh, students to uh, remember every single move in the curriculum. That's a lot of moves, but uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to show everything because students will pick out things that they like more than others. So I, I like to offer them as much information as possible and let them choose which ones they like and which, they're, which ones they're going to apply to their game because it's different for everyone. You know, you may have a body type that doesn't fit this, that that doesn't fit that move, or uh, you know, or you know, this is too. I had too much flexibility for this move, but I can do that one. It doesn't require flexibility, so I offer them all the moves, and they're all 
be separated in different categories, white to blue, blue to purple, and purple to brown. Excellent. And we have time for two more questions. So uh, the next question is, the curriculum divided by class or weeks? It's divided by, it goes, it, it goes, it goes like this. It goes, for example, you're going to pick a theme for the week. Okay, so the, the theme is going to be, and this is, if this is something that, for example, I, I reinforce things like guard and pass in the guard. We do, do those two things more than others because the, it's sort of like the, 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 the middle ground. Like this is where the battle is mostly fought. So it's the most common situation for you to see someone in a jiu-jitsu match is guard and passing the guard. Those are the two most common. So I put more energy into that. So for example, if I, if I feel my students are deficient with uh, uh, passing the guard, I'll, I'll reinforce that. Or if they're deficient, attack in the back, I'll show that. So you have to kind of read your class. So although you're spending a lot of time passing guard and playing guard, uh, you have to read your class and know where are their difficulties. So oh, they had, they're getting stuck in full mount all the time. I'm, like, every time I have a Q&A session, I'm being bombarded with the questions like, you know, how to escape mount, how to escape mount. So you know what? Next week, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have mount escape all week. So that's kind of how I base my classes, depending on the needs of my students. That being said, you should cover everything. You should cover every single situation. They're all, they're, they're all in the curriculum. Every single situation you, uh, you need to cover in a, in a match. Uh, the only thing you have to remember is that you have to be aware of the fact that maybe you're, you're, you're putting too much time into mount attack, and really what your students need is side control escape. So that, that's kind of for the instructor to figure out. Like, look at the class and go, OK, this is where we're getting stuck. Thank you, Professor. And last question, are these just one big information database, or are they split up one week at a time? Uh, it's it's, it's, it's going to be a big database, but it's constantly being updated. So it's not one of those things where, like, OK, this is in. We're never going to touch it again. And this is another thing I wanted to bring up. The curriculum is something that's going to be updated, um, I, I plan on updating it on a monthly basis. What do I mean by updating it? I want to add new things. Uh, I might pick out a video that you know doesn't have a like, great sound quality for whatever reason, so we'll switch it, we'll replace it with a better version of one, of, 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 of that same move. Uh, I, I will be adding new moves. This is a very dynamic sport. It's still at a very young uh, stage of development, so a lot of things that a lot of new moves are coming up all the time. I would argue that my curriculum is the most advanced curriculum out there. You know, a lot of moves that are straight out of the competition circuit are being added to that curriculum. Whereas if you look at other curriculums, like it's very, very basic. It's just so from the you know late 80s, early 90s. It's very, very basic. So I, I would argue that my curriculum is a more advanced one. But that being said, I am aware of the fact that it's constantly changing. So two years from now, there might be a new series of moves that will, that's not around right now, but that, should, that have to be implemented to the curriculum. So it's something that is going to be updated. But to answer your question, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a weak database. It's going to be one large database. And you're going to choose uh, the moves that your students need to work on. Once again, you have to cover everything, every single situation. But you emphasize the ones your students are having a hard time with. Thank you so much, Professor. And that's all we have time for today. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody, especially Professor Drysdale, taking time out of his schedule. Uh, that is another great webinar, and uh, we're really looking forward to the, the curriculum and seeing all the videos. Uh, so this, this is, we're real excited about that. So Professor, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if there's any other questions, everyone could either email uh, seminars at drysdalejujitsu.com. And thank, every, thank everybody uh, for attending today's webinar. And we have a lot more coming out from Professor Drysdale. So Professor, again, thank you so much. And on behalf of Champions Way, this is Sensei Nick. And Professor, if you wanted to get, uh, tell anybody about your, say anything you have upcoming or anything like that, uh, please do so at this time. And then I have some final announcements, and then we'll be logged off. Absolutely. Well, once it is a pleasure. Um, you know, I have a lot of fun doing these webinars. I'm learning a lot myself. And uh, yeah, feel free to visit our website, email us, uh, email Sensei Nick if you guys got any questions. Um, you know, if you ever come out to Vegas and you want, you know, I'd like to meet all you guys in person. That'd be great. So just let us, let me know if you're coming to Vegas. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, well, I'm excited about this. It's been a long wait, but you know, it's really because we're we're trying to put something that's really good together. So, I, uh, you know, just so you guys have an idea of how extensive this library is, we're talking about right now a little over 300 moves. You know, but I, I believe it's it's, it's going to grow. It's going to be even bigger. So it's a huge database. It's all. It's all been edited. Now we're just working on, you know, technicalities of, of, uh, uh, of 
uploading it to the, 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 the Champions Way platform. But uh, we're very close to finalizing this operation, and I'm very proud of it, and I'm excited, and I think it's going to be a huge success. Absolutely, and thank you so much again, Professor. And last final announcement before we log off, uh, we actually have Master Free Dodar. He's doing a webinar next week, uh, so visit championsway.com for that. Uh, and then also we have our, tra our training day in Toronto, so we're real excited about that. You can register for that as well um, on championsway.com. And thank you so again one more time, Professor. And on behalf of Champions Way and Perfect Mind, this is Sensei Nick, and we're signing off, and we will send out the recording. Thank you, everybody, so much, and have a great day. Thank you.